بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب The topic that I'll be talking about today I don't know if I can do justice to it It's an extremely important topic It's a very relevant topic and I'm going to try to make it accessible to everyone. And the topic is basically the miraculous nature of the Quran. And I'm sure everybody has heard about Quran and science and everyone has heard Quran is very miraculous. But I really want to give it in more than one layer. And I want to give it at multiple layers so that we can really understand the the significance of the multiple layers of the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. So I will attempt to do that today. But I want you to imagine this in a proper context. So let's create this scene before us. A man, he goes to a graveyard and he says, قُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ He says, rise up by the permission of Allah and a dead body comes alive from that graveyard. Now that man says to you, look, I showed you a miracle. I showed you a miracle. Are you going to follow me? Imagine you're standing there. Isa والسلام, is right there and he says to you, look, I made a dead man come alive. Who can do that? Other than the fact that I have support from the divine. Forget about that. Let's make it more dramatic. This man, he goes to a graveyard, a whole graveyard. People, they have become dust to dust. People's electrons, neutrons, it's all God knows where. And he says to the entire graveyard, قُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Rise up by the permission of Allah and everybody from that graveyard comes up alive. He says to you, will you follow me now? Have I proven myself to you to be a source of divine inspiration? Have I proven myself to you to be like a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from God? What would you say if this happened in front of you? And then the second question is, is the Qur'an as good as Qur'an is, but in our minds, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, where does it stand in comparison to this event? What is so miraculous about the Qur'an? What is so awesome about the Qur'an? And so this is what I want to grapple with. I want to bring you to this scene where this man is saying, قُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Rise up by the permission of Allah. And he brings all these dead people back to life. And then I want you to bring you to the Qur'an. And I want to, you to answer the question for yourself. At what point is the miraculous nature of the Qur'an equivalent to or greater than that act of that prophet or that man going to the grave of yard, uh, the graveyard and saying قُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ At what point? At what miraculousness nature of the Qur'an does it become that significant, that important, that great? So let's start by... I'm going to set the scene by two verses of the Qur'an. Two, as, two parts of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَقَالُوا And they say, meaning, those who don't believe in this message, they say, قَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ Why doesn't some miracle come down? Why doesn't some sign come down? مِنْ رَبِّهِ From their Lord, from Muhammad's Lord. Why doesn't he send down some miracle? قُلْ إِنَّمَا آيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Indeed, the signs are there with Allah. The miracles are there with Allah. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ So Prophet Muhammad is saying to them, Look, the signs, the miracles are there with Allah. My job is to warn you. And then Allah says, أَلَمْ يَكْفِيهِمْ Is it not enough for them? Was it not enough for them? أَنَّ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ That we have, O Muhammad sent to you a book. تُطْلَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ That you recite upon them. 
ان في ذلك لرحمه وذكرى لقوم يؤمنون and indeed in this is a mercy and a remembrance for the people that believe and the second part of the quran that i would like to start off with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَقَدْ دَرَّبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذِ الْقُرْآنِ We have مِنْ كُلِّ مَثْلٍ We have given every type of example every type of layer of, of, of the similitude that can be given for the people مِنْ كُلِّ مَثْلٍ فَأَبَا So they refused وَأَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورٍ But most people they are ingrateful Now what is the miraculous nature of the Qur'an? Here, they were saying to the Prophet ﷺ, Look, show us a sign. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, we're not going to show any sign. This is discussed also in a lot more details in Surah Al-Anam. Allah said, No more signs. The sign is this, the sign is the Qur'an. That's it. What is a miracle in the Arabic language, first of all? What does it mean to show a miracle? Mu'za. It literally means, it comes from the word ajiz. Ajiz means to make someone weak. When you give someone something to see, like this man who goes to the graveyard and makes the dead come alive, they see something that makes them dumbfounded, that makes no sense, that makes their brains go weak. There's no explanation you can give for this other than the fact that there must have been some divine intervention. <coughs> In the same way, here is Muhammad. Now compare one with the other. Here's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is he? He's not a very well-read person, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's extremely intelligent. Now don't make a, I mean, I have to keep the lines of adab here very strictly. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a miracle, was not able to read and write. As, as part of the sign that he's a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was an ummi, he was unlettered. He couldn't even read poetry, even the poetry he liked, he couldn't memorize. Not only was he not literate, but the entire environment that he was in was illiterate. The whole place. Now here, in a society of where you can count the people that are literate in your fingers, a man comes up and he starts reading to you a book. Is that amazing? What if we add this to it? Not only does he recite to you the book, that book by this unlettered man becomes the absolute best composition of any work in that language. Is that impressive? Here's a man, he goes to the grave, Qum bi'iznillah, dead bodies come out. Very impressive. Here's a man who lives in an illiterate society, comes with a book out of nowhere. And he starts reciting that book and that language, the, in that language, that book becomes the standard of eloquence, the standard of style. Impressive? Maybe not. But then let's look further. When somebody wants to write a very eloquent piece of work. And see, the miraculousness of the Qur'an in the Arabic language can be explained in a lot of details, but you need to go through a lot of studies to get there. And so it's very hard to articulate to the common masses. But there are some things that I think can be articulated to even the common masses to understand the, the, the unusual nature of this book. And one of the things is, is that when some great writer writes, when some great writer writes, he uses fancy words that are not part of street language. Because if you use street language in your works, the eloquence of your work goes away. One of the miraculous things about this book was, is that it used the common day language of all the Arabs. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِذِكْرِ Quran was in very easy Arabic. 
If you read the Qasidas, you know, it takes more effort to understand the Qasidas, the poetries of the people of the Juhala, of the Saba Mu'allaqat, of the people of that time. It takes more effort to understand, a lot more effort to understand the poetry than it takes to understand the Qur'an. Because Qur'an was revealed and its miraculous, sublime nature, it surpassed Arabic liter literature despite using the language of everyday, everyday language. Can you imagine doing that? So, I'm going to read to you what someone wrote. This man named Palmer, a, his name is E.H. Palmer, in 1880 recognized the unique style of the Quran. In his, in his introduction, in his book, he writes, Again, with them this style is not spontaneous as with Muhammad and his contemporaries. But it is as he continues and then he says, The style was natural. The words were those in everyday ordinary life while the latter Arabic authors and the style is imitative and the ancient words are introduced as literary embellishment. The natural consequence is that their attempts look labored and unreal by the side of his impromptu and forcible eloquence. What he's saying is when other people wrote their poetries, when they wrote their qasidas, they looked for words, you know, to make it embellished to make their poetry really beautiful. And here is Muhammad وسلم, is reciting Quran in everyday language and it's more eloquent than their embellishment of, of literary works. The smallest surah in the Quran, for example, Inna atayna kal kawthar, it's so, so easy that you can even understand it in the Urdu language. Another very interesting thing about this book, it does not use synonymous words. For example, whether you're writing in English or you're writing in Urdu, when you're writing something, you don't want to use the same word over and over again. Repeating the same word would make your work look repetitive. But yet when the Qur'an uses synonymous words, those synonymous words have exact meanings. For example, I'll give you one example, because I have a lot to discuss today. I mean, we're discussing everything from the mathematics in Qur'an, to chemistry in the Qur'an, to the language in Qur'an, and looking at all these different layers. The word zawj means what? Wife. And the word imra'atun means wife. Like you have imra'atul fir'aun, the wife of fir'aun. You have tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab. Ma aghni anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran that lahab. Wa mara'atuhu hamalat al hatab. So the word imra is used sometimes and the word zawj is sometimes used. When the word imra'atun is used, it is just a biological relationship. It is not a spiritual relationship. When the word zawj is used, it is also a... Yeah, it's a spiritual relationship also. They're synonymous words, but they're not same. Wherever in the Qur'an, there are two words that look the same, they're not the same. There is a slight significance between them. And the whole book is like this. Can you imagine someone writing a book in which none of the synonymous words, or rather every synonymous word has a very particular meaning? It would be very hard to do. That you yourself develop a terminology where the synonymous words are distinct from each other. 
if the word ard is used and the word balad is used. I mean, I can give you so many examples. The different words for enjoyment, the diff there are so many words. None of the words are synonymous. Then, let's take this further. That same book, in which the root words, the words within, because the Qur'an is primarily, first of all, an explanation in the Arabic language before anything else. Qur'an and Arabian. It is Qur'an in Arabic. And the nature of Arab, Arabic language is every word has a root word. And if you don't understand the root word, what is the meaning of this root word? You change the letters around. You'll understand the relationship between the new word. For example, the word ilm. I'm just going to give very small because I have a lot to discuss. Ilm is ayn, lam, meme. Change it around where it becomes the word amal. Why do we learn knowledge? So we can put it to practice. That's the difference between beneficial knowledge and not so beneficial knowledge. You take the word hikmah. Or rather, let me give you a very good example. Shukr is sheen, kaf, ra. Turn it around becomes shirk. Okay? If you're ingratitude, if you show ingratitude toward, towards Allah, it's like doing shirk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Fatiha, and there is a person, a mufassir of Qur'an, he did a tafsir of Qur'an just using this technique. Like for example, hamd is ha, meem, dal. Turn it around becomes madaha. Madaha means what? To praise. Same as hamd. Take the root word, turn it. Who can write a book like that? Arabic is the only language that can be understood by a computer. I mean, I don't have time to go into this. But you take a root word, which is of three letters 99% of the times, and you add suffixes and prefixes and change the shape of the word, right? For example, katib, the writer. Qatil, the killer, right? Darib, the hitter. It's, you know, if you know the formula for the shape of one word, like katib, fa'il, you know the shape of one word, you know the meaning of all the words in that shape. The point being is that the language even that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the final revelation is, is a very unique language. Not only is it a unique language, but let me also put this. Arabia, we call it the Middle East. Now don't be confused by labels that others have given. This is not, Arabia is not East if you look at the map. Okay, nor is it Middle East. It's really in the center of the world. It is in the center of East and West. And then the other thing is, so in terms of location where Mecca is, it's right in Shajaratun, la sharqiyatun wa la gharbiya. It's like a, a, a beautiful tree that is nor of the East nor of the West. And then in terms of History, which place in history Muhammad emerges, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? The Quran emerges at a point in history where the old old dynasties, the old empires, are dying, and it's an age of new dynasties, new empires. So this is where the Quran is coming from. The language, nothing synonymous. Everyday language. Change the words around, you get a better understanding of the word itself in the Arabic language. So this is just, and then you know, the Qur'an has this unique style. Where if the Qur'an is, you're reciting Qur'an. And when the rhythm of Qur'an, when the what? Rhythm of the Qur'an changes, it means the theme of the Qur'an has also changed. You don't need to give new headings. Okay, you know, the headings, now this subject has ended. And now this subject is starting, and this subject has ended, and this subject is starting. Always you will be able to tell the theme has ended, and a new theme has started, because the rhythm of the Qur'an itself has changed. Alif, la, meem, thalika al-kitabu la rayba fee, 
هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون إن الذين كفروا see how it's different إن الذين كفروا سواء it doesn't fit it's like a new theme so then the new theme continues until the rhythm changes again. And this is the style of the Qur'an. Again, you don't need to give headings. You don't need to give titles. It's understood. The subject has changed because the rhythm has changed. Not only that, now I'll tell you something that's really interesting. You know when people write poetry? When people write poetry, they try to create a rhythm. And particularly in any poetry, in any prose, in any speech that you write, when you're trying to make it rhythmic, particularly, it is very important with which, how the endings happen. How the endings happen. And if there's a qasida, a very long qasida could be a hundred lines or even a thousand lines. But generally, you're very successful. You're what? Very successful in poetry if you can keep the endings limited to 10 similar endings. 10 what? Similar endings. One of the amazing things about the Quran is 50% of Quran ends with noon. Eighty percent of the Quran is basically the end. The rhythm of the Quran ends in four letters: noon, mim, alif, ya. Eighty percent of the Quran ends in these letters, these four letters: muslimun, you know, ma anzalna alayk al Quran li tashqa, the ya at the end, and then mim. And Alif. To write a book that ends in just basically these four letters, and then there's the others. Other letters have been used. There's been um, maybe about five other letters used in the, the rest of the 20%. Not five, maybe seven or eight letters used in the rest of the Quran. And that's one of the miraculous things when you say, like Alif, La, Mim. Or Hamim. It's the same letters that these people used to write their Qasidas. It's the same letters that people used to write their amazing literature that they used to write. But here Quran is using the same letters, the everyday language, but yet composes the most eloquent of works of that language by this illiterate man in this illiterate society named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah says, Alam yakfihim, is it not enough for them that a man amongst them is reciting to them this Qur'an? Okay, still, now let's go back. Let's go back. Here's a man, he goes to the graveyard and he says, Qum bi iznillah, come up. Rise by the permission of Allah and everybody comes up. Very impressive. Here is a man in an illiterate society brings out a book that is the most eloquent book using everyday language, has its own style. Now let's add some things to this. Not only does it have a unique literary style, but he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, comes with a unique way of articulating it by a science that is completely un unique, never used before, the science of Tajweed. Right? Prophet Muhammad is reciting that same book in a completely unique way. In a completely unique style called the, art, the, the way of Tajweed. The art of Tajweed. And his book sounds even mu more musical because of the way that he is particularly himself reciting this book. Now mind you, a human being can be either very good artistically or he can be very good in things like mathematics or science. You cannot be as a human being a genius in both sides. It's just not possible. 
So here he is, he's a genius in terms of original musical style, Tajweed, original literary style, original everything in terms of fine arts. And then, let's look at some other aspects. This man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now he's reciting this book, so the question is, what does this book say? Okay, seems impressive. I mean, I think if you come to understand that an illiterate man made the best book of the language, that's impressive. Maybe not miraculous, but it's impressive. The fact that everything about it is unique, its composition is unique, how it moves from one theme to another theme is unique, very impressive. It has its own style of recitation, unique, very impressive. But now let's see what the book says itself. What does the book itself have to say? So let's go to a very different subject. Just so that you have an idea. In the Quran, more subjects are discussed. More what? Have you ever, you know one of the major sections in a bookstore that are sold, books are sold, is called the self-help section. You ever seen the self-help section in a bookstore? Well, self-help section is, you know, these people that make a million dollars by writing a book about how you can be a happy person, how you can be a successful person, and they have a whole book on one point or another. That's all it is. It's one book on one aspect of human life of how you can be a better human being. And they make a million dollars over it. So let us discuss what this book has. And then compare it with that miracle of this man who says, Qum bi iznillah. Muhammad discusses geology. He discusses embryology. He discusses events of the future. In this book, he discusses economics. He discusses political science. He he discusses so many issues. But I'm going to give you a very small taste of different, different subjects. And this is not the usual things that you hear, so this is why it's going to be interesting. Quran and geology. In, 19, in 1990, there was a man named Nicholas Clapp. Nicholas Clapp. He wanted to study Arab history. And he wanted to find a civilization that's been talked about, not in the Quran, it's been talked about in the Quran, in the words, Iramazatil Imad. Okay? But in his studies, there was a lost civilization that he wanted to find. So he went to NASA. Nicholas Clapp, Mr. Clapp, the professor, went to NASA and said, look, give me images of the Arabian desert, the Rubul Khali. And he tried to track down the city, and it's, 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 it's a lengthy process what he went through. So he finally found this city, Iramazat al-Imad. And if you dug up this city, what you will find is it is full, filled with towers and pillars. And then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies, Iramazat al-Imad, then what's the next ayah? Huh? Alladhi? And there's nothing like them in that piece of land, there's nothing like them. They have a unique quality, that is that they set up what? They set up pillars. He actually used the Qur'an to find where they were, and to identify who they were. By identifying the fact that they were towers and that they were pillars, he knew that that was unique to, to them. When did this happen? In 1990. You see, this is the amazing thing about the Quran. Who is Muhammad talking to, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? The Arab mind, when Allah asks the question. Did not the disbelievers, those who reject the truth, see that the heavens and the earth were one together? And then we exploded it. And we created from water every living thing. 
When Muhammad was reciting this, to which Arab man was he talking to? These were not questions that were relevant to the Arab mind of that time. The Arab mind was impressed about the eloquence of Quran. About how Quran was unique in its style, in its composition. How that no other book could end with so many few letters. Meme and Noon and Alif and Ya. And yet be so long. And so poetic. But which person is Muhammad speaking to when Allah is asking, did not the disbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were, were one and then we exploded it and we created from every living thing water. Uh, water for, we created every living thing from water. Not only does this speak to the modern physicist, but it's actually further than that. Something that's completely new subject nowadays. And that is called systematic thinking. That's where that comes in. Where you're not looking, because Allah talks about the, cre the beginning of the creation of the universe by the Big Bang. And then the beginning of the creation of life by water. And brings it together. If you study this subject today, in physics you'll learn Big Bang, in biology you'll learn... Evolution. Yeah, well, yeah, you'll learn evolution. But the fact that every living thing comes from water, you'll learn it in biology or one of those subjects. You won't learn it together. You won't learn it integratedly. It's only the Qur'an that in has integrated the two. And always when you study the Qur'an, or if you look at the signs of the Qur'an, it always is integrating. The Qur'an is always integrating. Not only that, let me take this about the, the miracle of the language I want to mention. For example, I'll give you three words. Again, this is about the language, but the language helps us understand the message. The language itself helps you understand the message. The word nafs means what? The word nafs, what does it mean? It means to breathe. Nafasat. Right? It means to breathe. As long as something is, has a respiratory process, it is alive. So the word nafs itself tells us what it means to have life. The word nafs means life. But the word nafs also means to breathe. So as long as something is able to breathe that has life, has nafs. As long as it has some respiratory process, it's alive. Another word, the word rajul. Or rajul means what? Man. But the word rajul comes from the Arabic word rijal, which means... Huh? Legs. And if you study biology or anthropology, they'll tell you that the significant thing about human beings, what we call Homo erectus. Why is he called Homo erectus? Because he stands on his two feet. He is a being that stands on his two feet. That's what makes human beings unique. So the word Rajul is used. Another word. Very, I mean, this is just in, in, the, in the framework of biology, I'm giving you three words. The word shaur means what? Intelligence. The word shaur comes from the Arabic word sha'ar, which means hair. Means what? Which species of animals has hair? Mammals. It tells us that mammals have some level, level of shaur, some level of in perception that is not there of other animals. It's just the Arabic language. Every word of it is mirac I mean, I can tell you specific, like every letter, every word in the Arabic language that starts with fa shows some action. Every word in the Arabic language that has jim in it has this particular characteristic, and you can go on. Then let's see this man, Muhammad وسلم, who's reciting this book. Right? So, okay, he talked about Iramazat al Imad. Impressive? Okay, impressive. But is it as impressive as that man who went to the graveyard and took out the dead bodies? Maybe still not that impressive. Just in the subject of geology. Because we know Muhammad didn't travel the world. Can we at least be that much sure? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the room, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Fi adna al-ard 
Adna al-ard means, Adna means lowest. And Adna means the nearest. Adna means near. Adna also means lowest. Like the word dunya is from the same root. Means the lowest. Yudnina alayhinna bi jalabi bihinna. That they bring down their jilbabs to the lowest end. And Adna also means closest. If you took, if now this is the miraculousness of the Quran, the Mufassirin who didn't know something, which I'm about to tell you, would have taken this ayah and did take this ayah to mean the word Adna as in near. Uh, near Arabia, there's a land called Jerusalem in which the Romans fought the Persians. And this is what it's referring to. Only later did geologists figure out that that area is 372 meters below sea level. It is the lowest area of the entire earth called Adna al-Ard, literally the lowest place on the earth. 372 meters, 72 meters below sea level. Muhammad was a geologist also? Okay. Composition of a, of a unique literary work with tajweed and you know all this literary things, amazing. You knew about some civilization? Okay, maybe he knew about it. Amazing. But Muhammad was also a geologist. And he happened to have measured the entire earth to say, this is the lowest point on the earth also. Wait, now we're getting close to that, you know, miracle we were talking about because that is... Somebody goes to a grave and says, Qum bi iznillah, come out by the permission of Allah. Very impressive. Somebody tells you without traveling the world, that's the lowest point in the world. That's also very impressive. Then let's go further. This is only one more example I'll give you in geology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twice in the Quran says, Nanqis ard Nanqis means what? Naqis, less. Nanqis ard min atrafiha. From all the corners, we're causing the earth to become deficient, less and less. And this has political meanings, but this also has a geological meaning. Because I don't know how Muhammad did this, وسلم, but somehow he was able to measure the land mass of the earth and was able to tell that the earth is getting smaller. Do you know this? This is a National Geographic. Everybody has heard of National Geographic, something authentic. I'll just read this to you. The earth is smaller than thought. New measurements show. The earth was, just so you know, 200 times larger in land mass than it is today because the earth is losing mass through volcano eruptions and so on and so forth, through a lot of things going into space via different uh, systems. New measurements reveal the earth is smaller than was previously thought. And that is by two point, uh, you know, such and such. Uh, and then, you know, the article continues, I don't want to go into it. The point I'm trying to make is, at what point of the miracle of the recitation of the Qur'an? Or at what point does the Qur'an become a miracle equal to or greater than that man who goes to the grave? At what point? And if it is equal to that or greater than that, then we have to ask ourselves that if we were there with Musa when he parted the seas, or if we were there when Isa والسلام, did one of his miracles, what would be our response? You know what the natural response would be? The natural response would be, that's very impressive. Now the Prophet says to you, follow me. What's the natural response to that? What is it that you want me to do? And so the Qur'an is both a miracle in its discussion, meaning in itself it's a miracle, and at the same time it's telling you what it wants you to do. It answers both questions together. It's not just a miracle. But it is also a bayan, a, an explanation, a tubiyani li kulli shay. It is explaining to you what it wants. Okay, let's go further. <clears throat> 